morning. Welcome you today. Things really change quickly here. We just got out of Thanksgiving and right away we jump into the Advent season. Uh, it's the beginning of the church year, uh, which the first half of the church year, which runs through about early June, covers all the main events in the life of Christ. So Advent means coming. We're looking forward to the coming of Jesus. His first coming, obviously Christmas, uh, but also this season lends us to talk about Jesus' second coming, which we've actually talked about a couple weeks ago when we were talking about uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and chapter 5. But we're continuing on for a week or two here, talking about Jesus' second coming. And today's gospel lesson, Jesus talks about it. And uh, so during, and then we have Jesus coming to us in his word and sacraments also. Uh, this is the Advent season, which is uh, has the color of purple, which is a color of repentance. Why did Jesus have to come in his first coming? It was to take away our sins. So we reflect upon our sinfulness, but rejoice in the coming of our Savior. Uh, so we are also blessed to have this beautiful Advent banner that we received, what, I think, about a year ago. And so we're thankful for that as well. Now, there is one song at the very end of the service, which is new, but uh, it's very easy to follow. I think you'll catch on pretty quickly, and you should be able to hear our soloists uh, singing the, uh, the melody as well. And so I think you'll catch on. Well, let's rise and greet one another by distance, and then uh, we begin with our first tip.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We silently confess our sins to God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And our Advent candles this year will reflect upon prophecies from the prophet Isaiah who spoke about our Savior's coming here that he would be born of a virgin and yet he would be God in human flesh. Isaiah 7 verse 10 and following says, Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. together the introit which comes from Psalm 25. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Jesus, and come in the clouds with all your glory and might and with all your holy angels, that we may be delivered from all things that threaten our souls and bodies, and that we may live forever with you in perfect peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
The Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah, the 64th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When, did, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, and mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you, who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls upon the name, or your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please rise. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite you to take out the insert, or not an insert, but I think at the back of the bulletin there's an outline of today's sermon, along with the text, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, the other day I was driving and I was listening to the radio and someone said that the stress level in America is really, really high, and especially in the Midwest. And I go, well... That's not very surprising to me. I mean, look at all the things that have happened over the last year. One thing piled upon the next thing. In addition to the struggles you may be going through in your personal lives, you've had, of course, the virus and the downturn of the economy and the financial stress upon families. And then we had violence in our cities and then the contentious and, and uh, uh, contested elections we just had, and you feel like your world is out of control. In today's gospel lesson, we learned that things really are and continue to be out of our control. Uh, and this text is very alarming to those who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, yet very comforting to us believers. 
And what we learn is that the events of our world now out of our control will continue to be out of our control as the end draws near. If you go back earlier in chapter 13, Jesus is talking about his second coming. Throughout this chapter, Jesus speaks about certain events that will happen, which are signs of his second coming. He talks about signs among nations. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, nation fighting against nation. And then there are signs in nature itself. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines, Jesus said. There will also be signs within the church of two kinds. One is a false teaching. Jesus said, many will come in my name, saying I am he, and will mislead many. And then also within the church, will have persecution of Christians. They will deliver you to the courts. You will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake. Jesus said all of these terrible things threatening to us. And yet, as Jesus goes through these various signs, he points out to one bright light when he says, and the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus, will first be preached to all the nations. So the good news of salvation will not be snuffed out from this earth, something we can hold on to and believe, but it's also something that we can share with others. And as you think about that, we recognize that it's not our goal simply to survive, as many people are kind of in the survival mode right now, it's not simply to survive or be entertained by Netflix or something, but it's to proclaim this gospel before Jesus comes again. Jesus predicts that things will be out of control in these signs that indicate the nearness of his coming, signs in nature, signs among nations with wars, signs within the church. But as we get to the very end, just before Jesus comes, we realize that things will continue to be out of our control. Maybe that makes us feel a little anxious. And Jesus said, but in those days, and this is part of our text today, verses 24 and 25, but in those days, after that tribulation that he just spoke about, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Now, there's nothing more predictable than our sun. We wait for it to rise on the east and then, and then set in the west. And then if we were to go out of town at night, we could look up and we see thousands and thousands of stars every night, same thing. And yet all of these things will vanish, the sun will be extinguished, the stars will tumble from their positions. A God's hand which upholds the universe and keeps the stars in place will be withdrawn. And in verse 31, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. Our world as we know it will be no more. And it's a good thing to keep in mind as we get into the holiday season where we tend to focus upon gaining things and giving things away, that the things of this world will not last. You remember Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount said, do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but treasure up for yourselves treasures in heaven. At the end of time, all the material things we have will be destroyed. I was once listening to a chapel talk in a Christian school, and the speaker was talking to Christian teenagers, and he was explaining how Christians and teenagers ought to, by God's will, in a good way, make money, and how they are to spend their money. And he said, well, if you buy a candy bar, that will last you maybe 10 minutes. If you buy a car, it could last you 10 years. If you buy a house, if you got a little older, made a little bit more money, that would last you maybe a hundred years. If you spend your money on the outreach of the gospel, it will last someone in eternity. And so how do you want to use your money for things that last? And the point is here that material things are of temporary value, whereas the gospel of salvation has eternal value. Things are going to be out of our control 
as time goes on and we see these terrible signs in nature, among nations, and in the church, out of a control when Jesus, right before he comes again, and the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars fall from the sky, and then all these things now in quick succession, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, not as in the first coming when Jesus came humbly and in a manger and disguised his godhood and in order that people put him to the cross, that he suffer and die for our sins. And so the bad news for Jesus, his suffering and death became the good news for us in that he won for us the forgiveness of our sins because he took our sins upon himself and died for us and then rose from the dead. That we who confess our sins to God, trust in Christ, have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life with him. And he comes in the clouds with power and great glory, all of his glorious attributes shining forth for everyone to see his power, his holiness, his omniscience, he knows everything, his love, his faithfulness, his mercy. And all of his holy angels will be with him. And just even imagine that sight. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. So as time goes on, things are out of our control. And yet, in this text, we learn that everything is under the control of Jesus. Then you will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And here Jesus is called the Son of Man. He is a true human being. But as you look at the text where, we, where Jesus speaks about himself as the Son of Man, it's obvious that he is also God who does miraculous things. So he's truly divine, truly God, and truly man in one person. He's not like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or Winston Churchill, men however great they might have been in their various occupations, but they are dead. Here Jesus speaks of himself as being alive and coming with power and great glory, and no one can stop him. And he will come with purpose, and then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. His servants, these invisible agents, his angels, will be sent out by him to gather the elect, those who are chosen by God, to be his own by grace. And that's what the elect makes us remember, that God chose us by his grace to be his own, that in time we now heard the word of God, repented of our sins, trusted in the word of God that Christ died for our sins and rose again, that we might have forgiveness, and now by the power of the Holy Spirit, God works to change our sinful lives. These elect will be drawn from the four winds uh, to be united, the children of God. And these elect consist of the living Christians, so if he came right now, we would be the elect that are living, but also those who are dead that who are elect. And so we learn about the resurrection will happen at that time. And we call this the general resur resurrection because he will raise the bodies of Christians and non-Christians, as Jesus told us in John chapter 5, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. The good deeds spring forth from faith that Christians have in the Savior. So whenever a person believes in Jesus Christ, he comes to know God's forgiveness. He's saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil. The Holy Spirit enters his heart and he begins to do good deeds, which are the evidence of faith. And Jesus sees that evidence, he knows that faith is in the heart, and these will be raised to a resurrection of life. And those who did the evil do deeds, which showed that they didn't believe in Jesus as the Savior, these will be raised to a resurrection of judgment. Now the Christian who is dead, his body is raised, is now freed from the effects of sin, our bodies renovated into perfect bodies without age, without pain, without broken backs, no aching muscles, no virus or anything like that. Renovated and powerful 
body. So all these wonderful things are under the control of Jesus. He's gathering his elect. He's raising the bodies of the dead and uh, renovating the bodies of Christians. And then we have the grand reunion that, uh, of the living and believing Christians. The Apostle Paul wrote of that in 1 Thessalonians 4, which we studied a few weeks ago, when he said, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, which is, bodies be raised from the dead, and, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Dead Christians will rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will be always with the Lord. So the grand reunion, with the Lord of believers and not and, and believers both dead and living with the Lord. Uh, amazing thing. And that is also the time of the judgment, which we call judgment day. So all of these things happening in this just amazing day. In Matthew 25, Jesus spoke about that. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him again. Then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And to the sheep on his right, the believers, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And to the goats on his left, the non-Christians, he will say, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's good news and bad news here at the judgment when there's this separation of believers from the non-Christians. It's a very bad day for the non-Christians because the Christians had the gospel of salvation that they were sharing with the unbelievers in hopes that they would come to faith and be saved. And now that opportunity is gone. It's a comfort for Christians because the persecution which the non-Christians have and gave to them, which Jesus spoke about here, will cease. And so we will no longer have that stress in our lives. We will be at peace. So all of these things happening, the resurrection of the dead, the, uh, the rejoining of the Christians and uh, believing, dead and the believing living together in a grand reunion um, and then we have the end of the world as we know it the physical world being burned by fire and our text merely refers to that in verse 31 when it says heaven and earth will pass away and uh, next week we will talk more specifically about that aspect of the end of time so what we see Though things are completely out of our control, they are in the control completely by our Lord Jesus. He's in control of time, in control of his angels, nature, the enemies of Jesus over death itself, and we, as his dear children, rest securely in his kingdom. And it's not only that Jesus controls everything at the end of time when he comes again. When you look at our text, you see right before the end, Jesus is in control. Listen carefully to verses 24 and 25. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Now we have to give you a little English grammar lesson right now. Actually, it's the same in Greek. It happens to be about verbs. Uh, verbs have an active voice and a passive voice. Very simple. If you say the man kicked the boy, the man is the subject, kicked is the verb, and in an active verb, the subject is doing the acting. That's why they call it active voice. The man actively kicked the boy. The man is doing the action. Now, if you use a passive voice, it's just the opposite. The man is not acting anymore. He's passive. He's not doing anything. Something is happening to the man. So the man was kicked. That's a passive verb. The man, the subject, was kicked by the boy. And in this, these two verses, we have two passive verbs. So it says, the sun will be darkened. It doesn't say the sun will darken itself. 
says the sun will be darkened, you say, by whom? Well, by God himself. And it says the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. It doesn't say these powers shake themselves, but it says they will be shaken, again, by whom? By God, by Jesus. So all of these forces, all of these powers, uh, are under the control of Jesus right before the end. And of course, you know from your knowledge of Scripture that it's not just at the second coming, not just, just before the second coming, but all through history, Jesus is in control of all these things. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about loving our enemies. And he says we should love our enemies because that's what God does. He loves his enemies. He seeks to save all people. And in Matthew 20, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. So why should we love our enemies? Because God does good to his enemies. The sun rises in the morning and it shines not just on Christians, but it shines on non-Christians, an evidence of his love. But that's God's son, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So God is in control of his son. He's God's in control of all of nature. But not only is he in control of the inanimate things like nature itself, but he's watching over us, his believers in particular. So when you get to Matthew chapter 10, and Jesus is sending out his disciples to preach the gospel, he warns them that they are going to be persecuted, and yet they should take comfort in this, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not fear, you are of more value than many sparrows. That's really a nice verse to think about, especially as so many people are worried about the virus holding up at home. You know, nothing's going to happen to you apart from the will of the Father. Two sparrows are not worth very much, not, yet not one sparrow in all the world will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. But you're more, worth much more than many sparrows. Not even one hair will fall to the ground apart from the Heavenly Father's will. So things are out of our control, but they're all in control of the power of God the Father and our Lord Jesus. But God is not only interested in preserving our bodies. What, what good is it that God just cares for our bodies throughout life and then we die and, and we're lost to the eternal fire? God is especially concerned about our souls and our bodies eternally. And so we read that heaven and earth will pass away, verse 31, but my words will not pass away. And you think of the things that are of great value to you. Maybe you have a trophy from some time in your life that you really value. Maybe it's your furniture or your car or your house, whatever physical thing you might have that you value, these things will pass away. But Jesus says one thing will not pass away, and that is my words. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. They give us eternal life in body and soul. So these are the important things of life, Jesus' words. Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, my wife and I drove up to Kansas City to see our daughter there and son-in-law and came back yesterday. And she's halfway through her pregnancy. She said that they both had gone to the doctor to get uh, ultrasound. And she said that the pictures that they have now are just, just so precise, so clear. And she said that you could see the blood pulsating through the umbilical cord, which of course, uh, the mother brings the food and oxygen to the baby through the umbilical cord. Um, and the baby grabs the food and the oxygen and it uh, supplies the baby's body. And you think about it, that, that umbilical cord is the absolute one thing that that baby needs, could not survive without that cord. 
And that's what Jesus is saying here. Everything else is going to pass away. But the one thing you and I need, the one thing that God provides that will not pass away, no matter what happens in our world today, is his word will not be taken away from us. This word which shows us our sinfulness and our need for a savior. The word which points us to Jesus and his suffering and death for us and his resurrection. This word that also directs us how God would have us live as his Christians. It's there to guide us until the end. Our world is out of control. It will continue to be out of control in many ways, all the way up to the end, but all throughout this time and at the end, Jesus is still in control of everything. Now, if you say there's one thing that is in our control at the very, uh, and it comes to us in the little parable that Jesus tells in our text. He says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. We're a little bit of ways away, but about March, things will start warming up again. And then you'll look at the end of the trees, at the end of each branch, you'll see it getting soft. A week or two later, little leaves start forming. <coughs> and you know then that summer is near. Very simple parable. Jesus said, when you look and you see all these signs take place, the wars and rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the famines, uh, the signs in the church of false teaching and persecution, you know that Jesus is right at the door. And we can say in our hearts, ah, Jesus has not been around for 2,000 years. I can do whatever my heart desires, even though it's not what God desires from me. Well, Jesus says, don't think that way. When you see the signs, this is a command, recognize, that's a command in Greek, recognize that Jesus is at the door. So what do you do? You cling to the word of God. You have the word of God in your homes. You have your word of God at church. And you study the word of God. Let it convict you of your sins. Let it turn you to Christ, your savior. Let it show you how God wants you to live in these days before his coming. And that gospel will continue to be preached to all nations. The God's word gives you and me a purpose in living. It's not simply survival in these days, but it's proclaiming the gospel. Why else are we here on earth? So if we were to summarize our text, I guess you'd say take comfort because God is in control. Take hold of God's word. Let it do its work in your life. And take the gospel to the world. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us rise now to confess our faith to the triune God in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, 
and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we enter the Advent season, we give you thanks for your first coming in a manger. You chose to take the burden of our sins upon yourself that we might be freed from sin, death, and the power of the devil. We live in an uncertain world, so many things going on, most out of our control. But we thank you for your almighty power over the sun, the moon, and the stars, over all things. We are your children, and you watch over us, and we praise you for this. And now you have promised to return in the clouds as we wait in eagerness for your coming. Encourage us, us to use your eternal word that shows us our sins, declares forgiveness in Jesus, and gives us life. Help us to carry out that one great purpose we have of proclaiming the saving gospel with the lost. Then come, Lord Jesus, and bring about the resurrection of the dead and our grand reunion with you and our fellow believers and all the holy angels. May your blessing be upon those celebrating birthdays, Brianna McFadden, Vicki Bodmer, Sue Palmeyer, Charlotte Roberts, Gabrielle Page, Sally Traeger, and Jude Keller. We give you thanks for bringing healing to Judy Newman, Brendan Lisa Carroll, and Irma Drosky. And we ask that you would continue and complete their healing. Comfort Diane Andrews and other family members in the death of her mother, our member Lorene Wagner. Comfort them in the knowledge of her strong faith in her Savior. We comfort the Braden family also in the death of Mike's stepbrother and Cody Misty McDonald's son whose father passed away. May this time of sorrow turn the hearts of all the family members in faith to their Savior, Jesus. Bring healing then also to Carly Yarrington who is having seizures, to Teresa Schwartz and Mike and Janice Braden, Marilyn Inkey, Robert and Bonnie Buffington, Linda Fulton, Carolyn Carlisle, Judith Wessels, Catherine Shin, Tom Rogers, Misty McDonald's daughter Heather and grandson uh, Wilder, and uh, Kathy Greer, Renee Davis, and El Elaine Hellcamp, and all those who are in hospitals and nursing homes, and others that we mention in our hearts. We ask that you would bring relief from the coronavirus to people around the world, allow businesses and schools to remain open, and protect all those who serve in hospitals and clinics. Well, Father, we give you thanks for our government and all who protect us. Give our nation's leaders wisdom. Give strength to our police officers, firemen, soldiers, and all workers in government that we may pursue our lives and our religion without fear of loss. Bless the work of Christian missionaries everywhere, including the Beckendorfs in Botswana and the Naumans in India. May your word, as proclaimed by them, take root in the hearts of those they serve. And finally, we thank you for the safe travel of family members and friends over the holiday weekend and ask that you would continue to protect them, who protect, protect those who travel yet today. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we sing the offertory. Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks. 
the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared, prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance so that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us by your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary, this helpful gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through this sacrament in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. I ran across that last hymn, uh, and I thought, oh, you don't know that hymn, but it really speaks what our gospel lesson says when it, it says, uh, the word shall endure and stand. Uh, of course, it's based on the parable of the sower, and then it, it says, preach the word, which is our, our goal, our purpose in life. So kind of summarize some of the things that uh, we talked about. Plus, the tune's kind of catchy, I think, and it's not hard to learn, so you learned something new today, so we're glad for that. And uh, so a couple things I need to mention, that today, after the Sunday School Hour, we are beautifying the sanctuary, so anyone who can stay and uh, help us, we appreciate it. Uh, what is it? Many hands make work light, something like that. Anyway, um, so we really appreciate that. Um, we'll also have some pizza for those who stay. Now this coming Wednesday, we have our first Wednesday evening uh, Advent service under the theme, Voices from the Edge. These voices are out of our normal activity, Voices from God, the first one being the Apostle John speaking in the book of Revelation. And that's at 7.15 this coming Wednesday. We also have our Bible classes at 6 o'clock. Also, uh, there's a sign up in the hallway for the various special services throughout this month, 
will need ushers and greeters and cleaners. So if you can look at that list and sign up for something, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, this coming Saturday is the Broken Arrow uh, Christmas Parade, and Ken's going to come forward and talk about that. Next Sunday, we have scheduled going out caroling. We will not be going into nursing homes. We will go to homes of members who don't get to church, who don't have much contact with people, and sing for them. We need everyone who wants to go to sign up today. If we don't get a certain amount of people, we'll probably cancel. So please sign up today if you'd like to go, and that's for next Sunday. So if Ken would come forward, he'll explain a little bit about the Broken Arrow Christmas Parade and what needs we yet have. Uh, about the same as always. Uh, as many people as would like to show up, have a spot for you. Uh, on page 20, it uh, has mine and Pastor Clayter and, and Marlene's phone numbers for anyone who's interested. And there's a sign-up sheet down the hall. Like everything else, we kept waiting on the changes. And then uh, finally this week, the, the gals that in charge of that called me and she said, well, City never called us and told us anything was different, so we're just proceeding as normal. I'm assuming there'll be the pancake breakfast at the Methodist Church like always. I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, but we'll be meeting there at the corner of Main and Detroit Street. And uh, Marlene's not here, is he? She's, she's pretty much running the show on this thing this year instead of me. But uh, if anybody has any questions, get with me. And love to have everybody there. It's always a fun time. That's about all I got. Thank you, Ken. And uh, God's blessings to everyone on this day and uh, throughout this week.